Welcome back, Math 105 student. Perhaps you watched the introduction to this exam number one review. This particular portion of it continues on into doing the problems. Recall that the four lenses that we'll be looking at all of our topics through are algebraically, graphically, numerically, and verbally. For example, if I had f of x equals x squared, we know that's a parabola with the vertex right there at 0, 0. We know we could look at numerical values of inputs and outputs, and we may have a situation word problem associated with that function. In the meantime, a verbal description of it could be take an input and square it to get the output. Thinking about that function as a verb, what does it do to the things you put in? And remember, this is what is uh, covered on your first exam, the prerequisites of factoring and exponent work, functions, which are in chapter one, the definition of what a function is and how to recognize what a function is, quadratic functions from chapter three, and power functions, all through the lenses that were previously described of algebraic, graphic, numerical, and verbal. So let's start. This is your exam one review. Number one, let f of r be the weight of an astronaut. So I understand f of r, the outputs are the weight, and the inputs are the distance in thousands of miles from the Earth's center explain the meaning of the following statements. I'm not going to write it out. I will just say, I know four is the input in this first one. That means I'm dealing with a distance of 4,000 miles. The output is 180, which is the weight of an astronaut in pounds. So letter A translates to at a distance of 4,000 miles miles from the center of the Earth, the astronaut's weight is 180. Input again is distance in thousands of miles. Output is weight. So given a distance of 4,000 miles from the center of the Earth, the astronaut's weight is 180. The other two are similar. At a distance of a thousand miles from the center of the Earth, the astronaut's weight is 36 pounds. And let us see, at a distance of 36,000 miles from the center of the Earth, the astronaut's weight is B pounds. So reading, you know, understanding what that function says in, in terms of inputs and outputs. Letter, or number two, says census figures for U.S. population, P of T, which would be your outputs in millions. T is years. That's your input. Okay. The domain is a set of years after 1950. So we see this table of values, understanding that these are all in millions and these are years after 1950. I kind of like to write it, then I really understand it. So evaluate P of 20 and interpret this meaning. So that's my input. My input is in years. So I go to my input of 20, and there it is. So 20 years after 1950, which would mean in 1970, the population of the U.S. was 205 million people. Letter B, 50 years after 1950, so in the year 2000, the population of the United States is 281.4 million people. And recall what a function is. A function is a relationship between two quantities such that each element in the first set or domain is associated with only one element in the second set. How do we recognize it graphically? Okay, it passes the vertical line test. Because if you had something that wasn't a function, you'd have one element of that domain associated with several outputs, not just one. 
So this function here, or excuse me, this relationship would fail the vertical line test, so it wouldn't be a function. Okay. In a table form, no repeated domain values going to different range values, because then this would fail the definition. So you would have something like this, x, and outputs, I guess, because it's not really a function. If I had like 10 going to 4, 11 going to 3, and 10 going to 9, because 10 is associated with two different outputs, we'd have a graphical situation kind of like that, it would indicate failure of function. Number three, you are plugging inputs into that algebraic function, algebraically defined function, and calculating the outputs. So if I put three in there, I'm really just calculating negative three times three squared plus eight times three plus one. So negative three times nine is negative 27 plus 20 four plus one and that gives me an output value of negative two f of four p i would just put the whole four p in because what does f do to any inputs squares and multiplies by negative three then adds eight times the input and adds one so the input is 4p, so I take 4p, square it, multiply it by negative 3, add 8 times that 4p, and add 1. That's what a, the function does. So simplifying this, I get negative 3 times 16p squared plus 32p plus 1. This negative 3 times 16 is negative 48p squared plus 32p plus 1. All right. f of x plus h is a little more complicated in this case, but f of x plus h, I would just put the whole x plus h into that function. It depends how you're the person who's requesting this answer or this who's making this question wants your output if they want it in this particular quadratic kind of format or if they want it expanded completely so i mean if you were asked to expand it completely you would multiply all of these x plus h terms out so negative three times x squared plus two h x plus h squared i'm doing it kind of quickly but i'm just multiplying these things out plus 8, and so on. Negative 3x squared plus negative 6hx plus negative 3h squared. And of course, you could put minus 6hx and minus 3h squared. That's actually a little nicer. Or you can leave it as plus negatives. So there's your final answer for that one. Number 4. Now we're looking at reading functions on a graph. What does f of 4 mean? It means 4 is the input. Inputs are graphed along or found along the x-axis. So I go to 4 and I read an output value of 2. So looking at the graph, 4 is the input, 2 is the output. The second question here says, is looking for inputs when the outputs are 4. So I come up to 4 and I say my output is 4 so my input is negative 2. Likewise for the third one the values of x I'm looking for input values when my output is 1. So I go to my output value of 1 and I see, oh, there's two output values of 1. One happens when x is negative 1, right there. And the other happens when x is 1. So there's two. 
And part D is asking you for domain and range in interval notation. So I'm going to erase all of this stuff. And I see that the inputs, they kind of go from negative 2 to 4. So I'm, and I don't see any open holes, so I'm going to include those. Negative 2 to 4 is my domain. And my range looks like it extends from 0 up to 4, maybe a little bit beyond if you look very carefully. Oops. If you look very carefully on your graph, it goes a little bit above there. So from 0 on up to 4. So 0 to maybe 4 plus a little bit. And it's inclusive. So that's the range. So number five says the development of time of an insect is how long it takes the insect to develop from egg to adult. Typically the development time goes down as the ambient temperature increases. So right below we're looking at a table, a numerical table, a value of points, which gives the time as a function of the temperature. So the development in time and days at an ambient temperature of h degrees Celsius for the blue bottle blowfly. So to evaluate g of 14, so the input is days excuse me, the input is the temperature and the output is days. So this is the temperature and these are the days. All right, I have to read carefully. So G of 14 would mean at 14 degrees Celsius, it would take 37 days for the insect to develop from egg to adult. Then we see that the time is going down as the ambient temperature increases. This is estimate, so this one's equal to 37. All right. At 14 degrees Celsius, the time to develop from egg to adult is 37 days. Estimate the solution to G of H equals 23. So the output is 23. That would mean 23 days, and they want a temperature that would give a development of 23 days. And so that's an estimate. So we're looking right in between here. The output is 23, so it would be right in here, meaning the temperature would be between 18 and 19 degrees Celsius. So approximately, or H is approximately equal to 18 and a half degrees Celsius. All right, number six, graph the following functions without using a graphing calculator. Find zeros x-intercepts, the axis of symmetry, vertex, y-intercept, and the max-min. So all of these functions that we're looking at, a, b, c, and d, are actually quadratic functions. They're all quadratic functions. And anything that can be written in this form, ax squared plus bx plus c, for our function, anything that can be written in that form is actually quadratic. None of these are in that standard form. However, all of them could be written in that standard form. So we look at this one, 3 minus x times x plus 2, and I'd rather have it written like this, negative x plus 3 times x plus 2. And I don't like having a negative in front of the x, so I'm just going to change it to be this. Well, makes it a little bit more clear what's going on in that function. And I can see that if x were negative 2, 
if x were negative 2, f of x would equal 0. I put a negative 2 in there, f of x would be 0. So I know an x-intercept is going to be at negative 2, 0. I can also see that if x is 3, this other factor is going to be 0. So 3, 1, 2, 3. The negative in front, or the negative on the x squared term, makes it a downturning parabola. So it's going to look something like this. Okay. To find the y-intercept, I put 0 in for x. And I go 3 minus 0 times 0 plus 2. That's 3 times 2, or 6. So that y-intercept is 6 when I put 0 in for y. I'll label it over here. The vertex occurs halfway in between the roots of negative 2 and 3, so that's a distance of 5. Half of 5 is 2 and a half, so I go 1, 2 and a half. So my vertex is going to be at 1 half, something a little larger than 6. So I put 1 half into my function, and I find out what that output is going to be. By the way, the axis of symmetry is x is equal to 1 half. That's my axis of symmetry. f of 1 half is 3 minus 1 half times 1 half plus 2. So it's basically 2 and a half times 2 and a half and 2 and a half times 2 and a half. Let's see, that's 5 halves times 5 halves or 25 fourths. So 1 half comma 25 fourths is my vertex and that is a max for that one. Okay. Letter B, an x value of 1 would make it 0, an x value of 5 would make it 0. So I'll move this over over a little bit would be nicer. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I have a 0 at 5 and a 0 at 1. And my parabola will look something like this. Oops. Doesn't curve up there like that. If I put 0 in for x, I have 0 minus 1 times 0 minus 5. So 0 in for x gives me negative 1 times negative 5, or a y-intercept of 5. I have an x-intercept of 1 and 5, and a y-intercept of 5. Halfway between 1 and 5 is 3. So the vertex occurs at 3. The, x, the axis of symmetry is x equals 3. And the vertex is going to be 3 comma, let's see, what is 3 minus 1 times 3 minus 5? Um, that's p of 3. So I put 3 back into the equation and I get 2 times negative 2, so that's negative 4. 3, negative 4 is the vertex, and that is a min, because this is the lowest point of that parabola. The remaining two are in, well, I guess a C is still in factored form. The max value of negative 3 and 4 would be my where my roots are, 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 3, 4. So negative 3 and positive 4. I can see that it's a downturning problem because of that negative 2. It's also probably narrower. So it's up like this, down like that. Okay, my vertex. Oh, let's find the y-axis, y-intercept. 
So if I put 0 in for x, I have 0 plus 3 times 0 minus 4. And times negative 2. So negative 2 times, that's a q of 0. Negative 2 times 3 times negative 4. So negative 6 times negative 4 gives me 24. So that's way up there. But all I'll need to do is label it as 24 and to make it so. The vertex occurs halfway between negative 3 and 4. So I see that there are 7 units between those two points. Half of 7 is 3 and a half. So I would go 1, 2, 3 and a half. Again, at 1 half is where my vertex is going to be. So P of 1 half is negative 2 times 1 half plus 3 times 1 half minus 4. And this is negative 2 times 3 is 6 halves, 4 is 8 halves. I'm getting a common denominator. So 1 plus 6 halves, or 6 halves, sorry. 1 plus 6 halves, 1 half plus 6 halves is 7 halves. 1 half minus 8 halves is negative 7 halves. So I get those two cancel, and I have a negative times 49 halves. I was thinking, so it's 49 halves, or 24 and a half. Okay, so that's my vertex. One half, 24 and a half, and that makes sense according to the graph, and it's a maximum there because it's a downturning parabola. And again, the axis of symmetry is x equals one half. Lots of information going on here. And the last one is in vertex form, so that's a little easier to find the vertex. So this parabola is shifted to the right three units, one, two, three. So that x minus 3, so we can see that if x is 3, that's where my low point is going to be. So 3 and then up 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Again, in case you forgot, vertex form is a times x minus h squared plus k, where the vertex is h, excuse me, h comma k vertex is hk. So 3, 5 here is the vertex. It is upturning and is stretched by 2, so instead of going 1 over and 1 up, I would go 1 over and 2 up, and 1 over and 2 up, so it looks something like that. My axis of symmetry is that x equals 3. The y-intercept would be 2 times 0 minus 3 squared plus 5. And so that's 2 times negative 3 squared would be 9 plus 5. So that's 18 plus 5 is 23. So that's that y-axis or y-intercept is way up there at 23. Sorry for the crammed little drawing, but that's what it is. 0, 23, my y-intercept. And I think I've answered all of the information for that one. Number 7. The minimum or maximum value of the quadratic expression in x. Well, I can see that the vertex here is going to be negative 7. It's whatever makes that parenthetical remark 0. So an x value of negative 7 would do that. And then it shifts down 8, minus 8. 
Since it's an upturning parabola, I know it looks like this. So we are looking at a minimum. And the minimum value of that then is negative 8. Number 8, you're asked to write the expression in vertex form and identify the constants a, h, and k. And if you remember vertex form, again, is this. We're essentially looking for the vertex and that stretch of a. So we do completing the square on this. Factor out a 3 out of the first two terms only. Oops. And 3 out of 24 is 8. I'm going to leave a little blank here. And then I say minus 15. That expression is currently equivalent to the above. These two are equivalent. <clears throat> To complete the square, which is making this expression a trinomial square, I take half of that b term, I square it and add it on. Half of 8 is 4, squared is 16. I add it up. Many people then will compensate by subtracting 16 over here, but that's not really what we subtract because we didn't only add 16, we really added 3 times 16. And so 3 times 16 is 48. I want to then keep balance, so I subtract the 48. I compensate. So now my expression is 3 times x squared plus 8x plus 16, and then negative 15 minus 48 is negative 58, 63. And now this tri trinomial square was by definition a trinomial square because it's some binomial squared, and that is x plus 4 squared. Is by design, because if you take x plus 4 times x plus 4, we have x squared, of course. We have 4x and 4x. That's the 8x. So that's why we cut that in half. And then the last term is the 4 squared. There's the 16. So that's how we designed it. Minus 63. So all of these are equal. So I can see that now the a value is 3. My multiplier is 3. h is negative 4. Again, whatever makes that internal piece 0. And my k value is negative 63. So my vertex is at negative 4, negative 63. but this is what was asked in the question. These are a bunch of solving for x. I don't know that I will solve all of them, but I'll solve some of them. There's basically two easy ways to solve the first one. First, you could move that 16 over x squared equals 16. Now, the thing that you should remember or try to, since you know graphs now, you can reason with the graphs and you should x squared is a parabola and it reaches the level of 16 in two places not just one so don't be naive and think there's only one solution to that of x equals 4 x does not only equal 4 but x equals plus or minus 4 so that's one way just like taking the square root <clears throat> okay the other way is to factor this, you can say x squared minus 16 is x minus 4 times x plus 4, knowing that that's a difference of squares. And in this regard, you'd also get x equals 4 or x equals negative 4. Okay. Letter B. This is, a again, a quadratic 
um, all of these except for f are in fact quadratic equations. So in, I put it in standard form. I, I'm going to move that 126 to the side with the x squared terms. Then I'm going to take out a 2. I'm going to see if this is a factorable quadratic. If it's not, I will have to turn to the quadratic formula, but I don't think I need to do that because it looks like it's factorable. I look at the negative 63 and I think 7 and 9, one of them's the opposite sign of the other, and there's a difference of 2 between 7 and 9, so that looks like it's going to work out just dandy. So x7 times x and 9. And since that's a negative 2x, I am going to make the 9 negative, so that I have negative 9x and positive 7x. So I have x is equal to negative 7 and x is equal to 9. The next one, it's all set up where I have a perfect square on each side, and I can just take the square root. But again, you have to remember if you're taking the square root in a quadratic, that quadratic is a parabola. If you see graphically, that quadratic function has a parabola for a graph, and so it, if it does reach that number, it will reach it in oftentimes two places. So x plus 4 will equal plus or minus the square root of 25, which is plus or minus 5. So then x will equal negative 4 plus or minus 5, which is negative 4 plus 5 is 1 or negative 9. I'm saying ors and ands kind of in different places. Usually x will be one thing at a time, but these are both solutions for this quadratic equation. Next one. Uh, let's see if this is factorable. Not sure it is, but we'll try first. And if it fails, then we'll know we have to use another method. So I need two numbers which multiply to give me 21, but also the inner and the outer products have to add to negative 11. So I'm going to try, could I try 7 and 3? Would that work? Could I have 6 and 7? And there's no way that 6 and 7 will equal negative 11. Maybe I put those in the wrong places. What if I put 3 here and 7 here? 14 and 3x have greater potential. The 14 should be negative and the 3x should be positive. So that works. So then I set 2x plus 3 equal to 0. Shove 3 over to negative 3 and divide by 2. So x is equal to negative 3 halves or x is equal to 7 to make that other factor 0. Letter E, nice one. GCF, I see an x in both terms. I factor out an x. x minus 13 equals 0. So x equals 0 or x equals 13. Either one of those would make that true. Now, I'm not taking time to check these solutions, <clears throat> but you on an exam, and especially with a calculator, actually should you know, take some of these numbers, stick them back into the equation, make sure that they work. Okay, you'll want to do that, especially in exam situations. Uh, this last one, factoring by grouping. I noticed that an x squared will come out of the first two terms. I get x plus 3. I notice a negative 16 will come out of those last two terms. So negative 16 times x, and negative 16 times what gives me negative 48? Answer positive 3. Oh, lovely. So then I see an x plus 3 as a common factor in both of those terms. So I take out an x plus 3, that's my GCF, and I have an x squared left, minus 16. I know x squared minus 16 can be further factored into 
x plus 4, x minus 4. So now, to make that first factor 0, x would have to be negative 3. To make the second factor 0, x would have to be negative 4. To make the third factor e equal to 0, x would have to equal 4. And that's it for solving those equations. By completing the square. Okay, so let's complete the square on this. x squared minus 8x. I'm going to ignore the plus 8 for a moment. Take half of 8, square it, and add it on. Sorry about that. I was planning ahead here. So I'm going to add 16 to the other side to keep it. Well, I'll do it the same way as I did uh, with the vertex form. I subtract 16. That'll you know, keep things the same. So I've added 16 and subtracted 16, so life is good. And then I complete the square on this guy. And that is x minus 4 quantity squared. 8 minus 16 is negative 8. Then I move the 8 over here. And now it's the same setup as the last problem, or one of the last ones. I take the square root of both sides. But remember that since this is squared, that graph, if it hits, would likely hit in two places. This graph happens to look like this, because it's four units to the right. And we can see that it's going to hit eight in two places. So I take the square root of both the left and the right. I put a plus minus there. So then I get x is equal to 4 plus or minus the square root of 8. And I'm going to leave it like that, even though it does simplify. If you'd like to simplify, the 8 is a 2 times 4, and the 4 comes out as a 2. So it's, it's that. Or you could put it in decimals on your calculator. I'm not going to, for the sake of time, I'm already running a long video here. But you can check those. When you put them in decimals, you can store them in your calculator and re-enter this equation to see if that x value makes it true. Then you'll know if you're right or wrong. Second one. I'm going to take out a 2. x squared plus 8x equals negative 14. So then I realize I'm going to add half of 8 squared, which is 16. But really what I added was 32. So I want to subtract 32 from that side. Then I complete the square. x plus 4. I factor this guy down. x plus 4 squared. And... I'm going to add 32 on that side and add 32 on this side and say that's equal to what's 14 plus 32, 22, 18. Now I can't take the square root uh, right away because that 2 is in the way, so I divide both sides by 2. I get x plus 4 squared is equal to 9. Then again, since I'm going to use the square root, I know that this graph, which is 4 units to the left, x, 2, 3, 4, negative 4 over there, this graph looks like this, and I know there are two places it hits 9. So when I take that square root, I have to put a plus or minus square root of 9. Now this one I know because it, square root of 9 is 3. So I subtract 4 from both sides. x is equal to negative 4 plus or minus 3. So negative 4 plus 3 is negative 1. Negative 4 minus 3 is negative 7. Okay. If it's a radical, you can just leave it unsimplified kind of like that, you know, as a radical 4 plus or minus root 8. But if it's if you know the root, if it's a perfect square, please do take it. Quadratic formula. Identify A. 
identify B. B is negative 5 and C is negative 12. Know the quadratic formula. It is the opposite of B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. So the next challenge is just, then that's the solution for X. The next challenge is just uh, entering this carefully on your calculator. The opposite of B would be the opposite of negative 5, which is 5, plus or minus the square root of negative 5 squared. Keep that negative in parentheses if you're entering it on your calculator so as not to get the wrong sign. 4 times a is 2 times c is negative 12 all over 2a. 5 plus or minus the square root of negative 5 squared is 25 I like to do some of these manually. And then I have 4 times negative uh, 48, excuse me, 4 times negative 24 is 96. So that's a minus, a negative would be plus 96 all over 2a. And I meant to put the 2 in for a over 4. So this is 5 plus or minus, uh, looks like we've got 121. That's a nice, perfect square. 121 is the square of 11. So the square root of 121 is 11. So then I have 5 plus 11 over 4, which is equal to 16 over 4, or 4. 5 minus 11 over 4 is negative 6 over 4, or negative 3 halves. And because I ran this so fast, I would back actually take those back and plug them in if I had some time, which I don't. I'm going to move on to the next one. I'll double check my sheet to make sure that I solved that right. Yep, 15. What did I get there? I got the same thing, just double checking. Next one, find a possible quadratic equation in standard form that has the given solutions and value for A. So if two is a root, then X minus two will be a factor, okay? Remember that, if R is a root, then X minus R is a factor because r would make it, putting r in for x would make that zero, just like putting two in for x would make that zero. If negative x is a solution or an intercept, x minus negative six or x plus six would be a factor. And a value three for a is put in front. So there's my quadratic function, but the question says they want it in standard form. This is in factored form, so I have to get it in standard form. So I just expand this. So x times x is x squared. Then I have positive 6x and negative 2x give me positive 4x. Negative 2 times positive 6 is negative 12. And then distribute the 3. 3x three squared plus 12x minus 36. There's a quadratic function with 2 and negative 6 for roots with a, a value of 3. The next one is really kind of a cool question because it's asking you to use the discriminant. Just this little part of the quadratic formula to determine the number of solutions to each one of these quadratic equations. So you just have to identify a, b, and c and calculate the value of the discriminant. So b is 8, c is 4, and b squared 
then would be 8 squared minus 4 times 3 times 4. This is 64 minus 48. I don't need to calculate what that is to know that that is positive. And if it is positive, I will have two solutions. And the reason for that, again, is if you remember what the quadratic formula is, is negative b plus or minus the square root of that thing, b squared minus 4ac, all over 2a. So if that thing under the square root is positive, it's going to be negative b plus that square root, and then negative b minus that square root of the thing, all over 2a. It's two solutions. The next one, we have a is 3, b is 6, c is 4. So I have b squared is um, 6 squared, 36, minus 4 times 3 times 4 again, but now 36 minus 48 is going to be negative. It's going to be less than 0, meaning I can't take the square root of a negative number over the real numbers, so I have 0 real solutions. Really should say number of real solutions. That's what we're looking for. And the last one, a equals 4, b equals 8, c equals 4. So b is 8 again, 64 minus 4 times a times c. 4 cubed, that's 16 times 4, or that is 64. So I have really 64 minus 64, which is equal to 0. If this value, the discriminant, is equal to 0, a square root of 0 is just 0. I'm not really adding or subtracting any numerical value, and my solution will just be negative b over 2a. <clears throat> so one solution. Okay? Using the discriminant, remember, that's a nice helpful tool to determine how many solutions there are to any quadratic equation in standard form. Number 14, the graph of a quadratic function is shown below. If the function expressed in the in standard form, say whether a and c are positive, negative, or zero. So what we see here is we see that that's my value of c, it's the y-intercept, because if x were 0, those terms would 0 out, and I just have c. So 0, c is always a point on a quadratic in standard form. And I see that c is positive. Another way to say that mathematically is greater than 0. A here, since I have an upturning parabola, a is also positive because we have an upturning problem. That multiplier would make all the outputs a positive value in this case. Now we have vertex form in, in letter B, and they want A, H, and K. Well, A is not going to change, so A is still going to be positive. It's still upturning. I'm going to say it this way, though, A greater than 0. HK is the vertex, right? Because if you put H in for X, that makes it 0. And then we lift it up, K unit, so HK is my vertex. So H is over here, and K would appear to be on the x-axis. So it looks like h is left of the y-axis right there, and so h is less than 0 or negative. You can say it either way. And k is equal to 0 since it is that vertex is right on the x-axis. And the last one, letter C, can the expression for the function be factored as A times X minus R, X minus X? If it can, are R and S equal to each other? And the answer is yes. R and S are equal to each other, and they're actually, in this case, equal to H. Right? Because they're both the same thing. If it's crossing only at one place, R and S have to be the same point. So that's like... 
if it's negative 4, this would be x plus 4 times x plus 4. It's a double. It's what we call a double root. And so r is equal to s. And they are both less than 0 since that's that h is, or that vertex where that parabola is hitting the x axis is to the left of the origin. Okay, this question is information we've been using all along. The form for most useful for finding the smallest value would be the vertex form because it would give me the minimum, it would give me the vertex. Okay, values of x when the expression is is zero. And so that would be my factored form. In this case, I can see that x would being two or eight would make that equal to zero. Oh, and that's what it's asking. I guess I didn't answer that first part in part A either. So x equals two or x equals eight. The first question, smallest value of the expression, in this case the vertex would be 5, negative 9, and the smallest value would be negative 9. Oops, let me draw that better. So I know that the parabola is at negative 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, right there. So negative 9 is the smallest value. And the value of the expression when x equals 0, when x equals 0, the standard form is the easiest because, as you can see, we can put x an x value of 0 in right away. Those first two terms always will go away because 0 times anything is 0, and we always get the c term. And that is your y-intercept. Okay? So that's the expression value when x is 0. 0, 16 is where that parabola would cross that x-axis, or y-axis, excuse me, y-axis. Without solving, explain why that equation has no real solution. No real solution. Well, if I graph this, let's see. If I graph x minus 3 quantity squared, I'm looking at a parabola shifted to the right 3. You know that it has, it's upturning because the coefficient is positive. And if I graph negative 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, we can clearly see that these graphs do not intersect. There's no intersection, and there's therefore there's no solution. There's no place that that graph meets that graph. You could also say, you know, you cannot take the square root of a negative. If you're trying to solve it algebraically, that you take the square root of each side to get x minus 3 equals plus or minus the square root of negative 4, there's no real solution to the square root of a negative. So that's an algebraic reason. Here's a graphical reason. There's an algebraic reason. Find the number of x-intercepts and give an explanation of your answer does not involve changing the form of the right-hand side. So there there are two x-intercepts. I see two factors. I can even find them. The two roots, the two x-intercepts would be negative 3 and 5. Because I can see if I put those numbers in, the y will be equal to 0. So those are x-intercepts, negative 3, 0, 5, 0. If I think graphically on this one, too, 
I have a parabola that shifts to the right one unit, so an x value of one, and then up five, one, two, three, four, five, there's my vertex, and I can see that that, there's my vertex at negative, or excuse me, at one, five, and I know that this parabola is downturning, so from there it goes like this, meaning there's got to be two x-intercepts. Okay, just as there were two in letter A, but looking at different forms. Number 18, explain why the largest value of that parabola occurs when t equals negative 1 and give the value. Okay, well, we know this parabola is given, or this quadratic equation is written in vertex form, so we know the parabola is shifted to the left one, and we know then it's up 21 units. It is a downturning parabola, and it's vertically stretched by a factor of four, so it looks something like that. So we see that the largest value occurs at that vertex x value of negative one, and it is 21. Next one, uh, completing the square again to write that in vertex form. So I look at the first two terms, I'm going to ignore this plus 20 for now, and I take half of the b value, which is 3, and I square it to get positive 9. I've added 9, so I want to subtract 9 to compensate. I have x squared minus 6x plus 9 to factor that. I had x minus 3. It's always the sign of that b that I use. And then plus 20 minus 9 is 11. So there it is in vertex form. So my vertex itself is 3, 11. The smallest value then of this function, since it's an upturning parabola with vertex at 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 3, 11, the smallest value of that upturning parabola is going to be 11, and the x value at which it occurs is going to be 3. I always think graphically. If you know the graphs, they really help your reasoning be more robust. Some solving. Okay. Um, in this first one, I have a cubic in the denominator, but I'm going to multiply both sides by x cubed, x cubed, and I get 50 equals 2.8 times x cubed. Then I'm going to divide both sides by 2.8. Okay, now this one I'm also thinking graphically and I know right now I know what x cubed looks like. It looks like this. And therefore I'll really only be looking for one answer because whatever 50 divided by 2.8 is it's probably around 16 15 or something up here whatever that value turns out to be i can only see one intersection point but let's find it um i don't 50 divided by 2.8 is 21 i think i solved it earlier i'm taking a little look at this oh i didn't i didn't actually find that number i did this earlier i did 50 over 2.8 and in order to undo x cubed, I took the cube root or raised both sides to the one-third. Same thing, right? Cube root raising to one-third. The reason for that being is three times one-third is just one, so that's just x. And then I found out what the cube root of 50 divided by 2.8 is, and that is 2.614. And again, you know, if you're wondering, am I right or am I wrong? Is this working out? I would definitely take the time on an exam to take that value, store it in your memory, or just, you know, cube it, write it down, divide 50 
by that and see if it's 2.8. Double check. This one, 12 divided by root x equals 3. I don't like the square root in the denominator, so I'm going to multiply both sides by the square root of x. I know that x can't be 0, so I'm not, it's not an illegal move because it wouldn't exist if x were 0. 12 equals 3 roots of x. So 4, I'm going to divide both sides by 3, sorry. And 4 equals the square root of x. And this one you can actually look at. You could square both sides. 16 equals x. If you didn't know, you could rewrite x to the 1 half equals 4. And then in order to undo the 1 half power, you could square both sides. Okay, so x equals 16. And you can double check that. Square root of 16 is 4, and 12 divided by 4 is 3. 22. The energy E in foot palms delivered by an ocean wave is proportional to the length L of the wave times, so that's fun. Okay, I like thinking about things in visual format, the energy is proportional to the length of the wave times the square of its height. So the length times the square of its height. Okay, lots of energy there. So let's write a formula for, for that. Energy is proportional. So I need a proportionality constant to the length L times the square, you got to read every word. These problems you got to read real carefully. The square of its height. So there's my function. Next part gives me parameters to stick into this function. A 30 foot high wave, so I know h is 30 feet, of length 600, so 600 feet, So that's going to be squared. Delivers 4 million foot pounds. So 4 million foot pounds of energy. Find the constant of proportionality and give its unit. So this is in feet. This is going to be in feet squared. And these are in foot pounds. Okay, so taking this down here, I have, you just really just plug in stuff. These, they, they actually look harder than they actually are. So 4 million equals K times 600 times 30 squared. 30 squared is 900. This right here is 5, 4, 0, 0. So 540,000. So K is going to equal 4 million divided by 540,000. Okay, let's see. 400 over 54, 200 over 27. And the units of that, let's see if I take foot pounds, I divide by feet, I'm going to get pounds. And then I still am dividing by square feet, so that's going to be in pounds per square foot. Okay. All right. I think I did that fine. So, 23, a quantity P is inversely proportional to the cube of a quantity R. Quantity P is inversely proportional, which means we have it in the denominator, to the cube of a quantity R.
find the constant of proportionality, so that's k, if p is 12 and r is 2. So 12 equals k over r to the third. So that's k over 8. So if 12 equals k over 8, to solve for k, I multiply both sides by 8. And I get k is equal to 80, 96. So this just means write your variation model. Which would then be p is equal to 96 divided by r cubed. There's my variation model using the value of k of 96. So I just rewrite that first one, but now plugging in what I know to be true for k. Okay. Number 24. A sporting goods store finds that if it charges D dollars for a pair of running shoes, it sells that many pairs of running shoes. Okay. So you have to be a little familiar with some of these problems, but D dollars, I like looking at the units, per pair of shoes. Okay. If I charge that much, I sell 600 minus 10 D pairs. So if I take the product of these two things, you notice the pairs are going to drop off and I get dollars. So my revenue in terms of D is going to be D times 600 minus 10 D. Okay. I know this is quadratic. If I were to write it in standard form, I first expand it and then reorganize it. So negative 10 d squared plus 600 d. So this thing is going to be a downturning parabola. It's going to look, it's going to be, have a y-intercept of zero because it's plus zero over here. So it's going to look something like, whoops, something like this. d is my input, so my dollars are down there, and the dollar per pair of shoes, excuse me, and my overall revenue, how much money I make overall, is going to be on that one. And so the zeros are going to be at zero, and I look at this and say, what value for D would make 600 minus 10D equal to zero. That's going to be that intercept over there. So I get 600. I shift the 10D over here. I divide both sides by 10. And D is going to be equal to 60. So it looks like if I charge $60 per pair of shoes, this must be an old problem. Running shoes are like $150 now. Anyway, if I charge $60, I'm not going to make any money at all in this old problem scenario. This might be from like, I don't know, year 2000. To find the vertex, we go halfway in between. So 30, if I charge $30, I get a maximum revenue. I make the most money. Okay, so the price that that maximum revenue occurs is $30. Now what it is would be stick 30 into the original formula and you get see my, my function is r of d equals d times 600 minus 10d so I have to put $30 in for d and figure that out. So that is 30 times 600 minus 300. So 30 times 300 is $9,000 would be my revenue.
Okay. 25. A quadratic function that has a vertex of that and opens down. So again, back to vertex form, you have to know vertex form and all the forms of the quadratic function. There's vertex form. <clears throat> so a y is equal to a times x minus h, so that would be x plus 6 squared here, minus a negative 6, and then plus 13. And now since it opens down, I just have to make a negative. So any value for a which is negative will work. So I'll just put a negative half there. A quadratic function that has zeros negative 1 and 5 and a y-intercept of negative 12. So we'll start off. I don't know what the multiplier is, but I do know x minus negative 1 or x plus 1. Because if I put negative 1 in there, it's got to be 0. And then x minus 5. And now it has to have a y-intercept of negative 12. So I do know that 0, negative 12 has to be a point. If you forget which one's 0, think about it graphically. If it's y-intercept of negative 12, let's see, for 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, then I know that point is 0, negative 12. I put 0 in for x. then negative 12 should come out for y, and I'm going to solve for a. So this is 1 times negative 5 times a, or negative 5a equals negative 12, or a equals negative 12 over negative 5, which is 12 fifths. So the final form didn't specify standard form or factored form, so I am just going to keep it as is and say 12 fifths times x plus 1 times x minus 5. Now if I had more time on this very long video, I'd go and graph that just to make sure you know everything looks good and the y-intercept was negative 12. 26. A ball is thrown off the top of a building that is 48 feet high with a velocity of 32 feet per second. Oops. I'm going to stretch this out. Um, and there's your formula for the height of that ball. So I like to think graphically again time is here, s of t is here, and that's height in feet. And this is time in seconds. So basically it's thrown off the top of the building and it's thrown with a velocity 32 feet. So the building is up here. I know that. I don't even have to, they don't even have to tell me this because if I put zero in initially, I get 48. Zero, 48. It's thrown up and over time, it comes down. Really, the path of the ball is probably like this. Like that. But over time, it looks like a problem. <clears throat> so how long is the ball on the ground, or ball in the air, before it hits the ground? So when it hits the ground, I can clearly see that height is going to be zero. So I put zero in for height. And I saw this, and my first thought is I can take out a 16 from these terms, or a negative 16, and maybe I can solve it by factoring. So negative 16 times t squared, and then a negative 16 out of positive 32 gives me negative 2t minus 3. That's really nice. So negative 16 times t minus 3 times t plus 1. So I can see that 
a t value of 3 would make this 0, or a t value of negative 1. But that's inapplicable to the problem. Really what it's saying is one second before launch, if this were a full graph of a parabola, it would be down here. But this part doesn't even apply because the ball started at 48 feet. So three seconds is when it reaches the ground. So three seconds. What's the maximum height of the ball and when does it occur? It occurs halfway in between the roots of negative 1 and 3. So it occurs from 1 to 3 is 4 units. So 2 units would be 3, 2, 1. That's not perfectly symmetric. I should draw this a little bit better. But that vertex occurs at one second. So it occurs at one second after it's been launched. And S of one second, now I go find what that height is. So by plugging one in here, I get negative 16 plus 32 plus 48. That's 16 plus 48, or 64 feet. Is that right? I think it is. So just to disqualifier, all of my strategies are correct in here, but maybe some of the calculations are not. I'm working without a calculator as I, as I work through this video. So double check those, but I think they're okay. Number 27, solve for the indicated variable. These are all literal equations. So I want to solve for r in this first one, v equals pi r squared h. And I want to get rid of the pi and the h first, so I'm going to divide those off. Pi h, I divide them off of here, pi h. v over pi h is equal to r squared. And then I take the square root of both sides. And when I take the square root, I usually put a plus minus in front of that because I know that it could be positive or negative. In this case, my guess is that the R stands for radius, and radius will only be positive, but I wasn't given that information, so I am going to put a plus minus there. Because it, without context, you, those variables could be anything. The next one I solve for p, so m is equal to 6 pi. Now, the, yeah, I think, I'll, I think I'll leave it. I'm going to put p over q like this in square root form, and I'm going to use a fractional exponent. I see that I have to divide both sides by 6 pi first. Oops, 6 pi. So I have m over 6 pi is equal to p over q to the 1 half. To get rid of that 1 half power, I'm going to raise both sides to the second power. Because I know I multiply those exponents and I get 1. So now I am looking at p over q is equal to m squared over 6 pi squared, which is 36 pi squared. I know I pulled a fast one on you. I squared the top and I squared the bottom. So 6 squared and pi squared. And now since I'm solving with p, I'm going to multiply both sides by q. So now I have that p is equal to q times m squared over 36 pi squared. I'm going to solve this guy for b. b is right there. So I'm going to first divide both sides by a squared. I get b squared equals 4a cubed squared divided by a 
squared. And so b is going to equal plus or minus the square root of all of that stuff for a cubed squared over a squared. I'm glad I didn't simplify that because the square root of 4a cubed squared is just going to be 4a cubed and the square root of a squared is a and 4a cubed over a is just 4a squared. So b is equal to plus or minus 4a squared. Okay. This lovely thing, when you bring the x to the seventh up to the numerator, you must make the exponent the opposite of what it was. So that is your function in kxp form. k is 2 pi, p is negative 7. This one is 5x to the 1 half because of the fractional exponent. Square root is written as x to the 1 half. k is 5 and p is 1 half. This next one is not a power function because 3 to the x is not a power function. In order for it to be a power function, you have to write it. It has to have, it has to be able to be written in this form, k, x to the p. And x is, as you can see, in the base, not in the exponent. This is actually what we call an exponential function, not a power function. It's a different brand of function that you'll be looking at in a future chapter. Not a power function. The next one is negative 9, and I'm going to write this as x to the 4th. And the ninth root is an exponent of 1 ninth. So that's negative 9x to the 4 ninths. So k is negative 9 and p is 4 ninths. The next one, 4, well, there's no x written there, but you could write an x with an exponent of 0 because that's the same thing as 4 times 1. Anything to the 0 is 1, if you remember. But this is it in that kx to the p form. k is 4, p is 0. The next one is equal to 4x to the first. Because x anything to the first is itself. So k is 4, p is 1. Again, we have kx to the p form. This is, by the way, I think 20, question 28. Um, I guess it was probably, yeah, 27. We entered the chapter 4 area of power functions, just so you know. All of the rest of these questions, I think, were in the quadratic and previous chapters. Yeah, quadratic, quadratic. Nope, this is a power function question. That's a power function. Oops. That's a power function. Power function. Power function. Oh, did I not answer that one? Ah, you're probably thinking, what should you do with 20? Question 20. I can answer it right now. That's 3x to the negative second. And this one, the coefficient is 3 eighths. If I bring x up to the numerator, remember it has to change 
sine of the exponent. Since it's a 1 down there, it becomes negative 1. And this one, that's an exponential function. It is not a power function, so cannot do. I don't want to say x because it's leading as a variable, so can't do that one. Okay, I didn't skip any others. So we had a few power functions mixed in here earlier. So more on those guys. Uh, this one in the form kx to the p would be 5g to the first p is power is 1. So this, since the power is 1, we would match it with graph 3. It is a linear function, and it's increasing, and it is proportional. This next one, a equals 6b to the negative 1. p is negative 1. It is an inverse, the proportional 1, and therefore it would be graph 2. So this is kind of like your 1 over x graph. It is decreasing. The next one is w equals 7a to the 1 fifth. The power is 1 fifth. So this is like a root. So as a increases, w does increase with it, but it pulls it down. It doesn't increase really fast. It kind of increases with this pull feature. So that's graph 4. Slowly increasing but not very fast or not as fast as those other power functions with um, integer exponents it is still increasing and it is proportional next one b is equal to 8 l to the negative fourth p is negative four this is still an inversely proportional feature, therefore decreasing, and therefore graph 2. Um, I think this next one is already in perfect kxp form, so 4.2 f to the third, p is 3, <clears throat> increasing very rapidly, graph 1, increasing and proportional. And so is letter S. S is in kx to b form, 9h to the 0 0.8. Now we have to pay attention. That is like a fractional root because it is that power right there is between 0 and 1. So it's kind of like a root. It's 8 tenths. It's a, you know, it behaves graphically like a square root curve. So p is 0 0.8. It is increasing, therefore it's proportional because as h increases, so does s, but it doesn't increase at a faster rate. It is graph number 4 again. Graphs are so important if you have got that. I love graphs. They are just everything. So it's nice to know what they look like when you're talking about solutions, when you're talking about behaviors, when you're talking about situations inverse and, and proportional. Um, so this one is an even power. Both ends would be in the same direction, but it is downturning. So I think the only graph that this would go with would be that one. Letter B. Um, we have an odd power, so we normally start out like that, but it is flipped over the x-axis, so it's a flip with a negative exponent, and so that would be this one. Okay. The next one, 6x to the third, there is no flip, it is just a cubic function stretched by 6, so there is that. Double check, don't just assume that the last one is the one left. 7x to the 6, both ends would be in the same direction, and it is positive, so we have that kind of graph going on. And keep in mind, you know, we have this flattening kind of behavior in here, because if you think about 
raising, I could say a tenth, putting a tenth into this function, seven times a tenth to the sixth, okay? If you raise a tenth to the sixth, you're looking at one over 10 to the sixth, which is one millionth, right? That is really small. So between zero and one, we don't have this faster growth. We have a real slow growth, okay? If we put something really small in like a tenth. So that's why we have this flat action here, okay? right around zero to one, and then it starts picking up really fast. 31, solving these equations and checking the solutions, I know that this guy's gonna have one solution because the graph again looks like this, and 40 is there, so in order to solve this, I take, oops, I take both sides and raise them to the one third to undo that cube. I take the cube root or raise to the one third. And 40 to the one third, I don't know what that is. Let's check your resources here. Uh, 3.419. 3.419. Letter B. I first start by adding 3 to both sides. I get 64. I divide both sides by 2. I get 32. And so k is equal to 32, the fourth root of 32, because I raised both to the one fourth, and I don't have that worked out, so you can do that. 32 to the fourth, to the one fourth. Um, it's going to be between two and three. Square root of m is equal to, I add five to both sides, 16. Remember that the square root is m to the one half. It helps to look at that and say, what do I need to do to undo that? I square both sides. I don't square root it, I square both sides. So m is equal to 16 squared, and I believe that is 256. Cube root of 5x plus 1. That's 5x plus 1 to the one-third. I subtract two from both sides. To get rid of the cube root, I cube it, and I cube that. So I have 5x plus 1 is equal to 8. Subtract 1 from both sides. 7 divided by 5x is equal to 7 fifths. For w cubed, I'm going to move the 9 over negative 9, divide by 4. And now to solve, I'm going to raise both to the one third power. And that works because it's a cube root. You also know it works because if you think about the cube graph, you know that it's going to reach a negative 9, 4 somewhere, right? So cubed to the one third is just w and negative nine fourth to the one third, whatever that is. I don't know what that is. Come you plug that on your calculator. Just make sure you use parentheses. Calculate negative nine fourth first as a decimal and then raise it to the one third. This last one, you could Square both sides if you wanted to, but you're on a path of destruction if you do that because this is a square root curve that shifted to the left four. You know it because if x were negative four, you get a zero. So you know it's a square root curve, and that square root curve never reaches negative three, so there is no solution there. And 33. Did I skip one? Yeah, I did. Uh, thing flew right by. Okay. For each pair, determine which pair dominates, which power function dominates in the long run. <clears throat> in the first one, 3x to the 14th versus pi x to the 14th, since the powers are the same, 
we always look to the powers first. Powers are the same, then we have to go look at the exponents, and since pi is 3.141529, that makes that guy dominate in letter A, because the pi is bigger than 3. In letter B, 3x to the negative third versus 3x to the negative 1. 3x to the negative 1 is, has a larger exponent, since negative 1 is greater than negative 3. Here, we would say pi is greater than 3 when we look at the coefficients, since the exponents are the same. Here, the exponents. Letter C, I have 5,000 x to the fourth or 0 0.25 x to the fifth. So it doesn't really matter. The coefficients have no bearing when you have different exponents. So the fact that this is x to the fifth will win out because the exponents always win out over the coefficient behavior. So exponents. Factoring, last one. Okay, thanks for bearing with me if you made it this long. Congratulations. We factor out a GCF. 11a to the fifth is my common factor so far. And then I look at the b's, and I have b to the third is common to both, and c to the third. So once I take 11a to the fifth, b to the third, c to the third, out of that first one, I'm left with b to the fifth, because I see b to the eighth, and then I see minus four. How many a's are left? Two. I got all the b's. I got almost all the c's. There's still one left. There we go. Letter B, looks like I do a little grouping here. I'm going to take out a 6P there. I get 7P minus 8. And I'm going to take out, let's see, a 2 there and a Q. And I get 7P minus 8. Look at how wonderful that is. Most of these are contrived to actually work. So then from there, I take out a 7p minus 8 from each one of those. I'm left in the first one with a 6p minus 2q. And that's the factorization of that. This one has a common factor of 5. Always look for that common factor first. x squared plus 5x and then minus 14. And then I find factors of 14, negative 14, which are add up to 5. I get uh, positive 7 minus 2. And remember to double check, and you should. I'm running it fast because this video is long, but you can multiply out and double check. Always do that. Okay. This next one, I'm thinking I'm going to break this six up. These are the harder trinomials because you have different possibilities to try. And you can do that A, C, B, D kind of method if that works for you. I tend to do a little guess and checking. That's my, my way. And since I'm doing the video, that's the way I'm going to show it here. So I'm going to break that to 2x and 3x. I know 20 is probably going to be 4 and 5, I'm not going to put the 4 in that factor. I'll put it over here because if it were over here with the 2, I'd know that I have a GCF of 2. So I'm going to put 4 there and 5 there. So then I'm looking at 8x and 15x. I'd like the 15x to be negative to make a negative 7x and the 8x to be positive. So that's my factorization. z to the 4th minus 81 is a difference of squares. So that's factored as z squared minus 9 times z squared plus 9. That is another difference of squares, so I factor that further as z minus 3, z plus 3. And this one into z squared plus 9. So that's my final factorization. And 
and we're at the last one. I'm going to factor by grouping again. I'm going to factor out x squared from those first two terms, and I get x plus 5. I'm going to factor out a negative 16 from these last two terms, and I get negative 16 times x plus 5. Then I factor out an x plus 5 from each of those, and I'm left with the x squared here, minus 16. And that's a difference of squares. So it factors as x minus 4 times x plus 4, and that's the last one. Have a good night or morning or afternoon, whatever it is, and good luck on your exam.